I do have, you know, friends and family in kind of blue state areas. Very, very few people seem to be actively supporting the regime. You know, it's at best kind of a grudging, well, at least it's not Orange Hitler type of state. Mm. And so I wonder, like, how long, like, what will be the play, you know, to regain popularity? Because to a certain point, right, we obviously know that it's not really a 50 plus one percent you know, this magical number of consensus, but regimes do require some amount of public support. And I guess I don't understand, maybe it's just, you know, endless, you know, fracturing into different, you know, special interest groups, you know, just eternal bio-Leninism, you know, just creating client groups. Maybe that's the play. The play is, the the play is to make, obviously, so, so we can kind of go through it here. The boomers are basically out. They just need to keep them quiet. Most boomers, even most Democrat boomers, know something is wrong, but they're too old and tired to do anything about it. Let's be fair, you know, they're in their 70s. That is what it is. Then you have the, you know, coming coming up after them, you've got sort of the Xers, which are the silent generation of our time. And then millennials, and, and the the route with millennials that the left imagines is to turn them all into client groups or to give them sort of political ambitions that are just totally removed from reality, su- such that their demands upon entering any kind of distant group are, are going to be, first of all, they're going to prioritize things that are antithetical to any healthy human social organization. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, I mean, imagine trying to incorporate the, the modern, like imagine just for shits and giggles that, you know, uh, the the left and the right were trying to work together into an organized political coalition against the mainstream neoliberal establishment. It would be it would be nuts because the requests coming from the left would be to essentially suspend reality and disestablish the moral regulations you need to survive as a religion or an ethnic group, and that's our conditions for being you know part of your coalition. It's kind of funny, but the 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 advent of intersectionality has essentially given an entire generation the 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 most. It, it's almost like a it's a wet dream for tyrants because they they made everyone emphasize the elements of their personality that are just the most psycho <laughs> and the most um you know, you know the most a- antithetical to actually living independent middle class lives or fighting for your own interests. Well, and the question to me is. The, the way that the left has has acquired power, right, is essentially like it's social fission, right? It is using entropy mm-hmm. to produce energy, right? We will break down political bonds. You know, Carlisle's, you know, divorce from all, divorce of all from all, and use that to translate it into political power. And the question is, can they keep doing this or will they create so much entropy? Will they break down so many bonds that you know, kind of the, the the money engine at the heart of all of this stops working. And I think that's kind of the open question. Like, is this something that they can, you know, keep, they can keep this system working at a lower and lower efficiency rate, or does it kind of come to a, come to a rest very quickly or abruptly? Uh, but this is the problem. I mean, it looks, the, the, mo- the money engine looks like it's not working so well anymore, but who knows what that means? Uh, we all, all we know is that it's working less well than it used to, but all, all that means is that we are in the decline phase. We don't have any idea how long the decline phase is going to last. Uh, j- just that the, the returns for increasing the complexity and, and the chaos are going to slowly start, uh, you know, disappearing. Obviously, the ruling class believes that it can just overcome all of this with AI. That's their sort of last hope, I suppose. Well, it's interesting because I know you've been been reading the the three body problem, and and I just had a conversation last night. I haven't finished it. Ah, (laughs) yeah, I have. I haven't finished. I, I didn't. Your last interview was the one one on your channel, I think, that I haven't watched because I haven't fin- finished reading that book. I'm almost done, but yeah, it's very right, good. Least, don't watch it. But okay. there, there is an interesting, and I will, I will reveal nothing. In the first half of the book, the we're good. <laughs> right, we're, we're essentially there's there's a there's a problem that cannot be solved by the traditional elite, and there is a character whose answer is, oh, I know, I'll solve the problem with AI. 
you know, yeah. and it's essentially this idea of like, well, we can't solve it. So we'll make a computer that will just fix it for us. Mm. And I think that you see this, this kind of like this problem with the relationship we've had towards technology, right? Where, you know, according to kind of this like progressive, I, I guess like wig version of history, you know, things are always getting better. And so the logic runs, well, if there's a problem now we cannot solve, if we just wait long enough, you know, a, a silver bullet will fall into our lap. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is that AI is kind of that, that prophesied magic bullet that, oh, we don't have to think of a solution because the natural force of history, you know, this, this kind of like grand trend over time will just do it for us. And to me, I think it's interesting because I, I, I'm not... I'm not a technical expert, but I, I'm not necessarily convinced about generalized AI. You know, to me, it seems like all of the interactions I've personally had with AI, which is basically in, in school as like a finance application, is mm -hmm. basically an incredibly sophisticated algorithm, which don't yeah, get me wrong, it's a powerful tool. Yes, exactly. But it's not, my society is broken, fix it. it, it that, yeah. That's a huge jump. No, I mean, this is, this is, I, I talked about this a little bit in my most recent video essays slash Substack article, but there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical of general AI, not to mention the fact that, that they're also hobbling their AI's epistemological um, effectiveness because they're, they're catechizing it with their own ideology. And, and that's going to become prohibitive as their ideology grows. Well, right, exactly. It's like, you know, when 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 your ideology only only touches maybe you know one or two relevant factors, then that's kind of a variable you can control for. But when when this kind of like new state religion becomes more and more jealous and more and more all encompassing, it's kind of like, well, when when you when you've essentially locked all but a few variables, like why are you surprised when you can only come up with one or two, you know, not particularly accurate models of what's going on? Yeah, and and you know I, I see Charlemagne in the chat saying something similar, but the the it's it's hard to say. I mean, you know, you you joke that you're obsessed with Rod Dreher, but but my sort of obsession this year has been SBF Sam Bankman Freed, which is just he's just the icon of how the mainstream thinks they're going to get out of this mess by creating sort of these new entrepreneurs. But the problem is, is that Sam Bankman Freed's success is totally manufactured or artificially by his own privilege. So, so he, he earns money and gives it back to them, but all the money he earns is basically 100% a bubble <laughs> based on his own, you know, his own prestige and his own ability to sell himself as a genius for doing kind of ordinary things. And so at the end of the day, all, all they're doing is just an elaborate way to kind of steal more money out of the system and create more chaos. And of course, these things always explode. Well, and, and there's an interesting you know, thought I've kind of been been playing with. And, and, and the boomers are, are kind of like one of the big boogeymen in our spheres. And part of it's justified, part of it's not. But there's something interesting, and this has been widely remarked upon, that the, the boomers have, especially liberal boomers, have theoretically progressive values, but functionally fairly conservative ones. Yeah. And so in every one of these institutions, because the boomers have never relinquished power, essentially, <laughs> until mm -hmm. they've only done it when they've died, right? That a lot of the chaos of the boomers kind of stated preferences has really only manifested behind them, you know? And while they were still at the helm, I mean, things were not good, but there was kind of a hard cap on how badly they could go. Because essentially, mm. every, everyone running those was, you know, and, and kind of like the interior level, actually relatively competent, you know, compared yeah. to kind of these like, it, these, these like horrible, spiteful mutants that boomers have kind of created, you know, with the ideology that they wanted to promote. And so I think that we're, we're kind of seeing is all at once, not really all at once, but kind of in, in the post Obama era, that the 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 children of the boomers both ideologically and literally have finally started to claw their way into power and it's creating just horrible disasters you know yeah. and we were kind of insulated by that by the selfishness of that same generation 